some nice food for you today. Uh, so please stay around and talk a bit. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so thank you again for coming. I can't believe we're halfway through already. <laughs> it's hard to believe. I'll be sad when it's finished. Um, so today um, we're talking about Armenians in early 20th century Britain. We're actually starting around the mid-19th century and looking at the merchant community in Manchester and then we'll go to the early 20th century towards the end of the lecture. Um, so we're spanning the sort of expansion of the community and, and then how it changes in direction in relation to the um, increasing um, the massacres and the violence in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so uh, I have to admit that the, the scholarly literature isn't, isn't very well, surprisingly isn't very well developed for this subject. Um, there are very few works that have been written. Um, so that's very exciting for the scholars of the future, the young scholars, uh, for any students of you amongst <laughs> the audience. Um, so there, there seems to be lots of work that can be done in the future to really shed light on the community, um, in particular the aspect of, of the activism of the early 20th century that the Armenian community engaged in, but also um, avenues of exploring the revolutionary movement in London, how that had its base. Um, in London for some period. Um, as far as I know, people haven't investigated that through the British documentation. Um, and the cultural aspect, of, of course, which I've started to focus on. Um, so for those of you who weren't here in previous weeks, my expertise is primarily on the Ottoman Empire. So I'm looking at the Armenians in Britain uh, really as an outsider. So I'm sure you, you'll be able to inform me on, on many of the things that I will touch on today. Um, and there are some things that I may have come across just purely through, le through reading um, Joan George's book, for instance, uh, but I'm sure you'll have lots of backstory to, to tell me about in the discussion afterwards. So that would be um, a, an, a very fruitful process of learning for me, um, giving this lecture. Um, but I will showcase some of the bits and pieces of research I've done, um, even though I, I primor primarily research on the Ottoman Empire, I have done some bits and pieces of research on Armenians in Britain um, over the past few years and, and that's um, chiefly because I've been lucky enough to be approached um, by people from museums or uh, with private collections um, that have been particularly interesting and so I've started to embark on pieces of research on, on those um, areas even though I'm not really based on, on um, UK Armenian history. Um, so, anyway, um, in the first part we will start by looking at the growth of the community in Britain, um, particularly the growth of the merchant community in Manchester, um, and we'll look at the example of Sopon Bezirjian, who's one of the, um, the research projects that, that I've started, that I just mentioned, um, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, then in the second part we'll talk about Armenians in London um, at the turn of the 20th century up to the 1920s. Um, we'll talk about um, cultural change in that community and the beginnings of Armenian activism after the genocide. Um, in the third part we'll go into that in, in more detail and we'll look at specific products um, of the Armenian community and how they tried to engage in activism. So we'll look at um, this um, journal called Ararat that was produced in 1917 after the genocide, uh, which we have a digital copy of here, so you might be able to look at it um, later on the computers. Um, and we'll also look at people like Zabel Boadjian, who were publishing books about Armenian culture um, within British, um, the British press at that time. And uh, you also have a copy here of, of one of her books, one of the first editions of her books. So um, we'll look at a few different things that, that British Armenians were producing um, in the early 20th century in the aftermath of the genocide um, to raise the British consciousness about Armenians and try to um, push British politicians and also ordinary people into engaging with the Armenian issue in the aftermath of the genocide. So um, we'll start with Armenians in Manchester. Um, so um, the Armenian community in Manchester seems to have primarily grown up because of um, Manchester being a trade centre that had contacts with Constantinople. And so um, Armenians who were based in Constantinople 
established a, a trading house in Manchester, and they often kept their uh, main base in Constantinople, and, and, and then they relocated to Manchester later on. That seems to be the case for, for many examples. Um, I was surprised to find out... Um, well, I, I became aware of the community primarily through Joan George's book on Armenians in Manchester. The Joan George archive is here, uh, for those of you who don't know. Joan George is a historian who has written um, at least two books that I'm aware of, one on the Armenian community in Manchester and one on the, the Armenian community in London. Um, and she did a fantastic job in terms of collecting together personal archives, oral histories, um, as well as filling in uh, the political context behind the growth of the communities both in Manchester and in London. So those are two books that, that are well worth um, buying if you have any interest in the area and they're published by Gomidas Press. So um, I had an awareness of the importance of merchants for the Manchester community from the work of Joan George already re re having read that. Uh, but I was even more surprised when um, one day in the British Library I was trying to do some background research about Armenian Manchester to fill in the context for a research project of, of mine. And so I, I ordered a copy of um, this trade directory called Edwards Manchester and Salford Professional and Trades Directory from 1906. Um, I ordered that year because I just thought that would be a sort of peak period to look at the growth of the community. Um, and so I was surprised to see quite how many names were recognisably Armenian amongst um, the, the professionals and the tradesmen that were listed in this directory. Um, so um, most of them are recognisable because of their um, Yan surnames, although sometimes they're, they're spelt differently, whether with a Y or a IAN. Um, but many others um, seem to be um, potentially Armenian names as well that don't have the Yan ending, um, like um, John Chinar, I thought it was likely that he might be an Armenian um, because Chinar is um, a well-known word in Turkish. Um, so s several of them I sort of speculated could be Armenians even though they don't have the Yan <coughs> surname, but that certainly there were enough with Yan surnames um, to show that there was a saturation of Armenian um, tradesmen in Manchester in the early 20th century, and many of those um, were shipping merch merchants, uh, merchants, furniture dealers and brokers, and calico printers and print, print warehousemen. So, um, unfortunately, the, the trade directory doesn't give any more information than these categories, um, but then you can go to further sources, whether in the archives at Kew, um, or, or um, local archives like the Manchester archives and find out more information about these individuals. So um, I was also lucky um, in that um, there was somebody who had done um, some work experience at the Manchester Library um, who had um, recently made a post, a blog post, about her um, voluntary work that she was doing at the Manchester Archive and Library about the um, Manchester Armenian community. Um, and she's called Sarah Cograve, and um, she did a series of blog posts on this link here that you can look up after the lecture, um, which is called Manchester Archives Plus. Um, and in her blog post, she wrote about how, um, at the time she was working in the archive and library in Manchester, she was living in this house in Dis Didsbury, in the basement, in a flat. Um, and um, she just happened to notice that on the gatepost of the house, it was carved masses, um, as you can see from this uh, image here. Um, and I found this example fascinating because there was no indication really from the architecture, it was fairly typical uh, mid to late 19th century um, Victorian, sort of early Edwardian um, residential architecture uh, from the exterior, so you wouldn't notice uh, that this was the home of a very illustrious Armenian merchant from the architectural style, um, unless you managed to notice as um, this lady Sarah Cogrev noticed on her gatepost the words of Massis as you passed by. Um, so already I started to get interested in this cultural aspect of these merchant families um, because um, the lady who lived there described um, how she'd done some research into the original owners of the house and they were the Funduklian family who were a family of very wealthy merchants in, 
Manchester in the middle of the 19th century. Um, so we know this, this example of um, a mansion was in fact owned by a very important Armenian merchant in the mid to late 19th century. Uh, so this was a stepping off point to try and explore um, more broadly the Manchester Armenian culture, uh, the culture of this merchant community, which is a project that I hope you know, some students in the future will explore further. Um, so um, many of these merchants were textile merchants, many of them were also luxury goods or carpet traders, um, so they brought those goods from Constantinople or elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire um, to Manchester and then either sold them there or, or moved them on to other um, centres. Um, there were 31 Armenian firms in Manchester by 1861, sorry the text is a bit squashed on there, um, and most families became very wealthy through textile trades um, and were already very wealthy and very important in Constantinople before they then moved to Manchester. And as, as I said, they established a base in Manchester um, sort of as an additional trading base in addition to their Constantinople base and they um, traded from both centres for some time. Um, it wasn't as if they migrated to Britain and they closed the operations in Constantinople. Um, instead they continued to go back and forth and they continued to establish really strong links through intermarriage with other very prominent uh, noble families and merchant families. Um, so for instance one example that's mentioned by Joan George is um, Mariam Pembe from the Kapumadjian family was mag married to Bogos Bey Dadian, who was one of the leading um, Amira families. Um, I mentioned the Amiras in the last lecture. They, they were this, this um, noble class of Armenians who ran a number of Ottoman um, areas of industry. Um, so they were already very powerful in the Ottoman Empire, and so making this intermarriage um, boosted the power of these um, merchant families even more. I have to apologise, by the way, about the way that I transliterate um, Armenian words and Armenian names because I use them. Usually, I just sort of continue with using um, the way that um, the the authors spell the names and the places in the secondary sources that I use. But in future, I think I should go through and and try to sort of unify all of the transliteration, <laughs> which is quite a big job to do, but um, I should do it at some point so that I don't confuse too many students uh, with all these different spellings. So, um, so I started to think about how um, these Armenians who'd moved from Constantinople, whether they had moved permanently or whether they were still going back and forth, how they established the community, what was important to them in um, their new home. How did they um, establish a sense of um, their home in their new um, location? Um, so Denise Haranian, in her book, The Armenian Diaspora, Cohesion and Fracture, she discusses um, some diaspora communities, including Manchester, briefly. And um, she says that the cohesion of the community was maintained by its symbolic framework that included church and cultural organizations at its center as a symbol of tradition, despite Armenians otherwise living their lives as pragmatic responses to the society in which they reside. Um, and, and this seemed to resonate with lots of the evidence that I was seeing, particularly about the Armenian community in Manchester, that they had certain symbolic aspects, like the name of Massis on their mansion, um, or like the Armenian church that, as we'll see in a minute, had certain symbolic aspects coming from um, Armenian culture or, or the sort of um, the view of the homeland, um, and that these aspects were um, used by the Armenian community to keep it together um, and to keep its memory alive of the place that they had come from. Uh, but at the same time, they were largely pragmatic and, and living their lives um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and um, um, integrating in many aspects of, of British society and culture too. Um, so a good example of this is if you look to the Holy Cross Armenian Church, which many of you have probably um, been to and uh, know better than I do. Um, so this was built in 1870, so this is quite an interesting example of the, the early culture of the Armenian community, the, the first generation of the merchants. Um, and how they established 
um, their culture, uh, how they represented themselves to outsiders and to insiders. Um, so it was built in 1870 and um, a number of merchant families got together and made contributions um, and many of these were from the Manchester community but also some of them were from London and Liverpool and elsewhere. Um, and these were listed by Joan George I think in her book when she describes the church. And um, a priest was already appointed who was Vartabed Curon, Curoyan. Um, apologies for my pronunciation and um, I found it particularly interesting that they appointed um, well-known Manchester architects who are already quite big names within the Armenian, not the Armenian, the, the Manchester uh, architectural um, scene in the late 19th century who were called Royal and Bennett. Um, so they didn't go for an Armenian architect, they didn't appoint somebody from back home and bring them to Manchester or anything like that. They appointed a local architect partnership to design and construct their church um, in 1870. Um, and it's interesting that they became an even bigger uh, success story within um, the architectural scene, um, Royal and Bennett, in the later years of the 19th century. Um, so they managed to pick a a sort of up-and-coming architect partnership who became even better known after they built the church. Um, as you can see from the exterior, it's built in a neo-Gothic neo style. Um, so the neo-Gothic style was popular within Victorian architecture generally in the second half of the 19th century. Um, you have examples like uh, the Palace of Westminster um, and numerous local churches um, were built in the neo-Gothic style in the middle to late 19th century. So um, there was nothing particularly unusual about choosing a, a Gothic revival style for the Armenian church in Manchester. They were sort of going along with the current fashion um, to some extent. Um, and they were building something that wouldn't look Armenian from the exterior, something that was relatively unassuming, something that would blend in with the urban environment of Manchester. Um, there's also a, a general neo-Gothic interior, um, so this is a view of the interior from the entrance looking towards the altar piece, um, and this is the stained glass window, sort of rose stained glass window, uh, that is the one that's looking out onto the street facade. Uh, but I should note that you can't really see the stained glass from the outside very well. Um, in particular, you can't really see um, what is the most significant aspect of the stained glass window, which is the Armenian Yetch letter, uh, which is in the center. So again, this sort of fits into this idea that blending in was perhaps a priority. So they wanted to have a church that was in the latest fashionable style, which was the neo-Gothic style, but also they didn't necessarily want to show Armenianness from the outside at this moment in time in the 1870s. Um, so most of the Armenian symbols are directed on the inside, or at least the, the openly Armenian ones. Um, and most of the Armenian symbols are in a similar way to the church that I showed from Constantinople last week. Um, do you remember I showed the, the dome of the church that was decorated with the Armenian letters in the Empire-style crests? Um, so similarly in the Manchester church, um, most of the Armenian symbols that you see are these Armenian letters, um, which, were, which had a holy status because um, the Armenian script was given directly from God. So um, there are also paintings, um, but I'm not sure if they were contemporary um, to the building of the church and they're movable paintings, they're not um, sort of frescoes or mural paintings. Um, the altar piece is quite interesting as well because it's not particularly Armenian. It has the Armenian letter at the top again, um, but the other features you could say um, they could equally be found in other Victorian churches at this time. So there's nothing that really stands out about the interior except for those Armenian letters. Um, another feature that is of interest in terms of learning about the community is these inscriptions. There's one on the bottom of the, the pillar, um, which is the pillar, I think, to the left of the, um, the apse in the centre. 
Um, and there are some more inscriptions there which are above the entrance to the church. And they tell you about donations to the church, um, again, mostly made by merchants in the community. Um, so I think there was a baptismal font or something like that that was um, built due to the donations of the merchants. Um, another particularly noticeable feature of this church um, was the textile collection that's housed in its um, treasury. And I was very fortunate to be informed about this by um, Penny Everinson, who um, is a member of the Ladies Association of the Church there. And she showed me around and she showed me uh, the textile collection uh, which they had in their church. And um, I had an Armenian student at Lincoln a couple of years ago, um, and she was working in the conservation department and she did her thesis on these textiles and so she was able to document some of them um, and so we found out a bit more about some of them as a result of her research which was a great opportunity but I'm sure there's even more um, there's many more theses and, and much more research to be done on this collection because it's a really large collection and it's very interesting in terms of um, telling us about where the community came from uh, because by and large I think these are the textiles that were brought with members of the community and then donated to the church um, whether it was upon their arrival or another significant event in their lives that, that made them want to donate to the, the church I'm not sure um, but as you can see they're stylistic really, stylistically really interesting um, many of them are very similar to Ottoman um, imperial court textiles um, so they were the highest quality textiles that were produced for the Ottoman Sultan and you know, members of his court. Um, and I have a friend who works on Ottoman velvets and silks and they're very similar to the textiles that she works on because they use this very expensive gold thread um, that was um, only used by the very highest um, status in Ottoman society. So um, it's very interesting that these are of such... Um, status and such impeccable um, craftsmanship as well as lavish materials. Um, the one on the left I find particularly interesting, perhaps someone might know more about this in the audience. Um, this one I don't think is particularly Ottoman in style. Many of the other ones that aren't on this slide, there are dozens of them in the collection. Many of the other ones um, in the collection are more typically Ottoman. So you can see things like, you know, carnations uh, that were motifs that you can see um, repetitively on Ottoman textiles. These two aren't very Ottoman. Uh, I would say the one, the one on the right does have um, some floral motifs that you can see in um, 17th, 18th century Ottoman textiles, uh, but it's mainly just the materials and the technique that's very um, reminiscent of them. Um, you can see, obviously, these crosses are in interspersed with the floral motifs, which show that it's um, culturally Armenian and not Ottoman <laughs> Muslim, belonging to the Sultan. Um, also, the one on the left, I'm not sure if that's typically Ottoman, because I haven't personally seen um, this um, motif of the lamps, um, some elements of this look maybe a bit more Persian than Ottoman to me um, because it has these hanging lam lamps that actually look a bit like hanging mosque lamps um, and um, you would tend to see them more in Persian textiles as far as I know and you also have these lions on top of the columns uh, which also look quite Persian to me. Um, so perhaps some of the textiles in the collection come from Persia and some from the Ottoman Empire, I'm not sure. Anyway, it needs further research because it's a potentially very interesting collection. Um, as far as I know, there hasn't been an exhibition or anything about these, but um, they would be deserving of one in the future. Um, the next thing that um, I found out to shed more light on these, the early generation of Armenians in Manchester is um, their gravestones in the southern southern cemetery and again I was lucky enough that Penny Everinson from the Manchester community took me here and showed me this section of the cemetery uh, otherwise I wouldn't have known about its existence uh, but again I found it really interesting in terms of how far were these Armenians 
um, building their gravestones in a traditional or a typical Victorian way. How different were the gravestones from other ones in the Southern Cemetery? Um, how did they show their Armenianness, and which members of the community were building their gravestones in a more typically Armenian way um, from the others? Um, so the answer is perhaps, perhaps obvious that the gravestones of the priests tended to be um, the most um, traditionally designed ones. Um, so you had the symbols of the, um, the status of the, the priest and um, you had the Armenian script on these ones. Um, but other members of the community tended to build, at least in the mid to late 19th century to the early 20th century, um, in a style that was largely um, indistinguishable from the rest of the cemetery. Uh, the main giveaway in terms of that these were Armenian graves was actually just the language. Um, so it was clear that the community um, was using several languages. Um, sometimes it was written in um, Latin script, but it was um, spelling out um, Armenian. Sometimes it was... Um, it seemed to be a sort of a mixture of perhaps Armenian-Turkish, a mixture of Turkish and Armenian. Um, so, anyway, most of the, um, the artistic elements, um, like this sort of angel, or the neo-Gothic canopy, or the urn with a sort of bit of drapery over it, many of those aspects were found elsewhere in the cemetery on non-Armenian graves that were from a similar time period. Um, so the only element that really stood out um, to me was um, the priest's grave and the rest of the graves and the use of language um, in those graves. So again, I, got, I started to get this picture that perhaps the Armenians in Manchester, the first generation of the merchants in 1850s, 1870s, 1880s, um, were largely drawing on the visual um, models that they had around them. Um, so they weren't making an effort to stand out through visual culture, at least on the outside at this moment in time. Uh, but perhaps this was just um, a reflection of the architects that were available. Uh, it may have been difficult to ask um, a British architect to design a tombstone you know, in the shape of something from Armenia. Perhaps they didn't have um, the, the visual models to, to provide the architects or the builders with. Um, and so they just decided to go with the models that were available in Britain at this time. Or perhaps this was a deliberate um, or unspoken policy to just you know, fit in in this first generation. Um, a final thing that I'll mention um, about the merchant community is that they were very important in terms of establishing um, organisations for benevolence and for bringing the community together. Um, so there was the Armenian Ladies Association of the Church that's still going today, that Penny Everinson, uh, who was my guide, um, leads. And uh, there were also very important organizations um, like um, Nubar um, Pasha's General Benevolent um, Foundation, which were established around this time um, as a result of merchant capital. However, um, it seems that many of these organizations were not um, particularly politically active and they were more active in terms of establishing um, facilities for the community, for um, orphans and, and um, perhaps less fortunate members of the community. So it was about um, providing assistance to those in times of need. We do have um, one journal called The Sphere, uh, which seems to have been um, engaged in some kind of um, political activity around 1863. I've never been able to see a copy of this, but um, it would be interesting to find one in the future. Um, but this is mentioned in Joan George's book, and that's how I know about it. Um, but perhaps in the audience we have people who do know more. Um, and in 1867, there was some degree of... Um, activism when um, the Manchester Vartabed Garabed Shah Nazarian travelled to Paris as part of a delegation to Napoleon III to campaign against the oppression of Armenians in Zaytun in the Ottoman Empire. 
Um, so they weren't totally apolitical, even though the benevolent organisations didn't seem to be very politically active when they were first organised. There were some instances, um, such as during the Zayton Rebellion, when um, there were um, expeditions um, with a political purpose, particularly going abroad. So to finish the section on Manchester, I thought I would just um, show you or tell you about an example that I've worked upon um, times before. I'm, I'm an art historian, so I tend to work on um, painters, architects, um, and um, anything in between those two. So Sopon Bizidjian is um, one of those in-between figures. Um, he seems to have been responsible for the vast majority of the interiors of the Ottoman palaces in the middle of the 19th century in Constantinople. Um, and so I knew about him from my work on the Balian family, who were the architects responsible for designing most of the Ottoman palaces of the middle of the 19th century. So I already knew him as a name. He wasn't a very big name, uh, but he was familiar to my ear uh, when I started to hear about him from somebody else. Um, so this is an image of the Bela Bey Palace, which was around 1865, uh, and I think he was probably likely to have designed the ceiling decorations for this. So um, I, was, I was quite surprised when um, Tim Stanley, who's the curator of the Islamic art collection in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, he approached me. And he said, um, could I come into the museum to have a look at some drawings that they'd just been donated? And so I went in. I didn't know what to expect. He was my PhD examiner, so he was already familiar with my work um, as a student. And um, he showed me these drawings. And they were huge drawings. They were about this big, uh, really large-scale project drawings, incredibly elaborate. As you can see, um, all the aspects of the interior and the exterior were all worked through. Um, very eclectic style, very imaginative style, uh, that seems to be a sort of oriental version of Art Nouveau. Um, and we had no information about what these were. All, all he said to me was that they recently were donated by a lady um, and that they had been passed down to this lady by her great-grandfather. Um, and her great-grandfather was someone called Sopon Bezirjian. And so he said, um, did I know about this person? And, uh, and I thought, yeah, he does sound familiar. So uh, <laughs> I did have some basis of um, information about him from my research on the Ottoman Empire, which was uh, very fortunate. And, um, and so although I wasn't actually able to identify what these were, um, I was able to put them in the context of his work in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and the curator, Tim Stanley, put me in touch with the lady who had donated the drawings to the museum, uh, because it turned out that she actually had a much wider collection of drawings, and that the museum had, had only been able to accept a small selection of them, uh, because it didn't have space for the entire collection. So, um, so um, we went about... Um, searching for a location for the rest of the collection of drawings, which was actually a massive collection of hundreds of drawings of varying sizes. So you can see there's everything from these tiny little notebooks where he's written all his um, accounts um, and his receipts and things like that, um, to um, little scraps of drawings. Um, these are all different drawings that are stuck together on, on bigger pieces of paper and put in files. Um, and there are larger drawings as well. Um, and there are also designs for aspects of furniture, jewellery, uh, as well as interior decoration. Um, <clears throat> so the Manchester Metropolitan University Library Special Collections now has the, the archive of these drawings, so you can go and visit them um, whenever you would want to do so. Um, so... Um, I started trying to think about how to, to frame this material in, in terms of research and how I could present it in, um, in terms of a research um, article or, or a book or something like that. Um, so the first step um, to find out more was to return to some textual sources and try to fill in some background um, because I knew about Sopon Bezirjian 
um, only as the decorator of the Balian's Palace. I didn't know anything else about him other than he was just associated with some of those works and he was a name that had come up in, in some um, other documents. So um, I went back to the source of Teotic and um, Teotic is an amazing source. Um, he wrote an almanac um, in 1920 to 1921. He was from the Ottoman Empire and then he relocated to France and um, when he was in France, he compiled this almanac, which was a compendium of um, entries um, that were mainly about this long, some of them longer, some, some of them shorter, about different people from the Ottoman Empire. Um, and most of them were sort of cultural actors, like members of the Balian family. Um, and luckily enough, there was an entry that was about Sopon Bizidjan within this almanac. Um, so if ever you're researching an architect, a painter, an actress, anybody from the Ottoman Empire, then your first stop should be this almanac. Um, and I think Vazken Davidian from Oxford University is making a digital version of it. Something He's doing a research project about Teotic's almanac at the moment, so it might be even more accessible in the future. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting source because it tells us about all these leading personalities from the Ottoman Empire, many of whom obviously didn't no, no longer were around by 1920 or had moved elsewhere. Um, and um, he seems to have sort of crowdsourced a lot of it and many of the entries were actually sent in to Teotic and then he would um, sort of edit them and then include them in his almanac. Um, so I'm not sure if this, I think it's quite likely that this was written by Sopon himself uh, and then perhaps edited and altered a bit by Teotic and included in his almanac. Um, so it's a very useful source, um, coming potentially from uh, the mouth of Sopon himself. Um, sorry, it's sort of cut, cut off a bit, but I'll read it through. So this is an English translation um, of the entry, uh, which was here in Western Armenian. Um, so it says, born in 1839... Sopon did not follow his father's profession as an optician, but instead was interested in the arts, specialising in miniature arts, after having been trained by famous specialists. By the age of, I can read from here, at the age of 19, he was given the onerous task of decorating the Turkish Sultan's palace at Izmit, and was thereafter appointed as the Sultan's decorator. He decorated subsequently the palaces of Kaitani, Sultan Aziz, Chiran, etc. Even the great marine painter Ivazovsky, another famous Armenian artist, much admired Sopon's talents after having viewed Sopon's works during a visit to Istanbul. We must not forget to mention the French Empress Eugenie, who highly praised Sopon. Sopon had earlier decorated the Izmit or Izmir Armenian church, as well as the St. Edmidzin. Uh, the Holy See of the Armenian Church's Cathedral's altar by 1902 by special request of the Catholicos, the Armenian Pope. By order of his protector, Sultan Aziz, so Sopon produced many magnificent paintings, one of which is displayed in the India Museum in London. After his protector's demise, Sopon visited Egypt, where he was given a grand reception by Hediv Ismail Pasha, Viceroy of Egypt, and then went on to Europe. Sopon continued with his work in London, where he was much admired, not only by Queen Victoria's daughter, Christine, but by being highly praised by high society and experts. At the Great Paris ex Exhibition, or Exposition, in 1900, it was Sopon who planned a sizable part of the Ottoman section of the exhibition. On that occasion, Sopon produced an excellent album concerning Oriental art and design, and in its preface, the president of the ju jury, Jordain, expressed his praise. Sopon also played an active part in Armenian national activities, the founding of an Armenian school in Cairo, Egypt, being one of his achievements. His marriage did not last very long, his wife being an Armenian actress, Arusiag Papazian, his son, Alexan Bezirjian, was better known by the name Theodore Birch and was no nominated chairman of the Printing Press Union in 1925. Sopon was alive until 1920. Um, so, as you can see, or as you've heard, this gives uh, 
quite a thorough, thorough outline of his, the different places that he lived and his major works, um, as well as giving a, a um, rather interesting picture of um, the, the praise of um, <clears throat> those in high status for his works, like uh, Queen Victoria's daughter Christine um, and the president of the jury of the Paris Exposition and, and so on. <clears throat> so I then revisited um, the Ottoman palaces based on that information and based on the information from the drawings um, in the archive. Um, and I started to get a much clearer picture of what aspects of the palace Sopon Bezidjan was responsible for. Um, because in the Ottoman archives, there's very little mention of um, individual craftsmen. Um, and even if the individual craftsmen are mentioned, you just get a single name like Krikor or Agog or something like that. So it's very difficult to tie them specifically to individuals that you can learn more about from European sources or from Armenian sources. So um, <clears throat> it's a great opportunity to have these Armenian sources about Sopon and also the drawing archive so that you can try and fill in the gaps um, that you can't really fill in from the Ottoman archive because the documentation is so limited. Um, so I started to get a stronger picture of what aspects he was responsible for and um, many of these things you can find parallels for in the drawings in the archive so it's clear that he was the one who designed these things. Um, like these kind of panels of ornament, this woodwork, a lot of these things um, are typical Sopon uh, works. Um, so this is just one example that you can find pretty much identical match in the drawings in the archive. So this is the cabinet in Bela Bay Palace and, and this cabinet drawing here is in the drawing in the archives in Manchester. Um, so you can see here this is a sort of, Sopon was very interested in creating a, a sort of neo-Islamic style in the 1860s, 1870s in these palaces. Um, so he fuses together a number of different Islamic um, styles um, and creates a, a new eclectic um, style for these palaces for the Ottoman Sultan. Um, so these are some more drawings of his, um, the column capitals again in this neo-Islamic, Islamic revival style that's bringing together a number of different Islamic styles together in the same um, pool of ornament. Uh, and these are his designs for ornament, so they're quite similar to the, the wall and ceiling panels. So there are hundreds of examples like this that you can find through the archive. I haven't gone through very methodically yet, um, but hopefully I'll get time in the future to, to make more direct matches. Um, another thing that I was fortunate to discover is that um, the album that was mentioned in Teotic that Sopon Bizidian published, the album about Oriental art, um, is actually widely available. Um, thanks to um, Amazon, um, Amazon often um, reprints um, old um, publications that are beyond their copyright. Um, so you can find these reprints on Amazon of all sorts of rare books uh, now. Um, and Sopan Bezidian's um, Albert Fine Art album uh, from 1889 just happened to be available on there. Um, Again, the curator of the V&A was the one who tipped me off about this. I didn't actually discover it myself. Um, and he sent me a copy. And, um, and so I was able to have printed out in full a copy of this book that Sopon Bezidjan published in 1889. And I have no idea how many copies he actually published at that point. There's a copy in the British Library, um, but I haven't been able to find anywhere else any original copies. Um, so it clearly did exist, but I don't know how widely it was um, disseminated. Um, so it was a book um, that was written by Sopon Bezidjan's daughter, um, Rose Bezidjan. Um, so Miss Rose Bezidjan. Um, it was um, put together by her um, and her brother, Theodore. Um, or Theodore Alexander, um, and apparently Sopon Bezidian had sort of 
told them, sort of narrated to them um, in Armenian what the content was. So that in itself is interesting because that indicates that perhaps he wasn't fluent at English and that it had to be translated from his Armenian into English to be published. Um, it was also published in French, so perhaps he was more fluent at French and, and, um, and also um, helped with the translation into the French version. So it's this... Um, rather strange book that is a collection of um, plates um, which are designs for essentially domestic British dis domestic objects, um, household objects, um, in Oriental style. So um, the one on the left says um, design for a table cover or tablecloth um, in Turkish style. The one in the center says, design for a fire screen in Persian style. And the one on the right says, design for a gilt metal frame. And that's, I think, in Arab style. Um, so there are three different national styles that are represented in the designs. Turkish style, Persian style, and Arab style. Um, and they're represented through the different kinds of ornaments. So the Turkish one has more tulips carnations, the typical motifs that would be on Ottoman Turkish art. Um, the Persian one tends to have more animal motifs, more pinks, um, more sort of smaller floral motifs. And the Arab one tends to be more geometric and have more browns and blacks and golds in it. So, um, so he is using these three different national styles um, to design um, what would be quite ordinary Victorian household objects. Um, and then the idea would be that Victorian ladies would buy this book and they would copy these designs and make the objects themselves. Um, so they would make the tablecloth or the fire screen or whatever at home. Um, and this was really um, part of a sort of zeitgeist, zeitgeist at the time um, that these pattern books were widely available and so Sopon was making his own version of these um, Victorian um, pattern books um, that were very popular at the time and, and Victorian women would um, go out and buy all these different pattern books and go home and make the designs themselves. So um, he's very clever in terms of adapting his expertise to uh, the local demand in Victorian Britain. Um, these are some more examples. So the one on the left is designed for a tea cosy in Arabian style. Um, and it's got this lovely crescent moon and star in the middle. Um, the one in the middle is designed for a bag in Arabian style. And the one on the right is designed for a slipper in Persian style. Um, so the slipper design is sort of flat and then you um, curve it round when it's made. So they're quite interesting in terms of um, how Sopon um, condenses various characteristics of each um, national style, the Ottoman Turkish style, the Persian style, and the Arab style, um, and how he communicates them into these Victorian household designs. Um, he's sort of simplified. If you look at the tablecloth that's in Turkish style on the left, he's, um, hopefully the pointer's working, he's got these sort of tulip designs here, uh, but he simplified them so that they look almost like an Art Nouveau pattern, um, and they're more, more repetitive and slightly more geometric than they would be in an Ottoman tile or something like that, in an Iznik tile, um, so that they, they would be more attractive for the Victorian consumers. Um, and also the fire screen actually looks quite Art Nouveau rather than resembling any, any particular Persian work of art. So. Um, I think they, he, he was clearly very familiar with Persian art, with Ottoman art, and with Arabian art. Um, and he sort of distilled some of what he viewed to be their essential characteristics. Um, so that would be um, the different colour schemes of those arts, some of their key motifs, and then he translated them into these um, designs that were more palatable for the Victorian audience. Um, because obviously he wanted to be successful and he wanted to sell his book and uh, become famous. Um, so the idea goes back to um, Owen Jones, um, who was one of the first people to make these kind of pattern books. Um, but Owen Jones was um, 
he had a different purpose. He um, carried out fieldwork in the Ottoman Empire, um, in Persia, but most famously in Spain, on the Alhambra Palace in Spain. And he, he carried out detailed fieldwork studies on these works of Islamic art. And as a result of his fieldwork, he made a book called The Grammar of Ornament, where he laid out um, three types of different Islamic decorative styles, the Arab style, the Turkish style, and the Persian style through his books that were based on his fieldwork of the buildings um, in those empires or, or, or areas of the world, geographical areas. Um, so Sopon Bazidjan was, was following on from this precedent, but Owen Jones had quite a different agenda in that he was trying to um, revive British decorative arts and he was trying to um, uh, provide a new inspiration, um, particularly for those um, students who were studying uh, minor arts at um, South Kensington as part of the, um, Vict what would later be the Victoria and Albert Museum, Museum or the South Kensington Museum. So he was part of a general revival to, um, to sort of turn British architecture and um, decorative arts in a new direction in the mid-19th century through looking to Eastern and Islamic works of art. So Sopon Bazirjian is, is following on from that and he also copied or he also participated in the methodology. Um, his archive seems to indicate that he did visit Islamic Spain as well and he carried out field work I think in Islamic Spain and Morocco, North Africa. Um, and some of the photographs and the drawings indicate that he visited himself those areas. Um, so he carried carried out this field work in order to inform his drawings and that's how he is so knowledgeable um, about these different national styles of Turkish, Persian and Ottoman because he had first hand experience from the Ottoman Empire but he also travelled to places like Islamic Spain and North Africa to see um, the Arab style works there. Um, but he's trying to do something different from Owen Jones with his book. Um, he's not only trying to tap into this Victorian um, domestic market for, for making these um, elaborate objects um, and the, the sort of taste for Oriental art at the time, um, but he's also trying to engage in some kind of soft diplomacy through writing this book. Um, so if you look back to the book, um, the book actually has quite a long introductory text. Before it goes into these images, it has probably five pages of text, something like that, where Sopon tells about himself, his life in the Ottoman Empire, his work for the Ottoman Sultans. Um, and during this introductory text, he, he sort of takes it on himself to try and correct what he views to be European misconceptions about the Ottoman Empire. Um, so he's trying to sort of use his role as a, a public um, intellectual or at least a, a sort of relatively um, well-known individual through publishing his text to try and um, alter people's perceptions about the Ottoman Empire and about particularly the relationship between East and West and the relationship between the Sultan and his Christian subjects. Um, so he says in the introduction in quotes, during my experience in Europe, I've seen that when we desire to have a thorough knowledge of a nation past or present as to its government, the character of its nation, its pursuits, etc., it is of the utmost importance, I would repeat, to closely examine with unprejudiced wide open eyes and to have some familiar intercourse with the natives themselves and not to fully trust sometimes the ignorant and prejudiced reports made by ambassadors, missionaries, newspaper correspondents, etc., whose positions naturally are far from being in real touch with the natives. And I may add that consequent on their respective missions, they cannot be familiar with the inner life of the people. Um, so here I think he's trying to establish himself as like a, a more authentic version of Owen Jones. So he views people like um, Owen Jones, the, the original version of um, the maker of these kind of oriental pattern books um, and subsequent um, painters and, and other um, individuals who travelled to the Orient and who presented themselves as experts on the region, um, he's trying to present himself as the true expert, being a, a 
member of the Ottoman Empire, a former member of the Ottoman Empire and a, a true Oriental in the um, contemporary um, parlance. So, um, he's also um, trying to inform the British public about the positive relations between the Ottoman Sultan and Christians. Um, he says, in quotes, how often rumour and ill-informed critics have represented that Oriental nations and their sovereigns neither its esteem nor place the least confidence in their Christian subjects or rayas. Well, decidedly, such in gross injustice as this is in urgent need of correction. And in regards to these absurd, absurd reports, the public of the West will do well to rely on the statements of those persons who have served in the different Oriental courts and governments, where it will be seen to what an astonishing degree absolute confidence is placed by all ranks and officials, from the venerable Sheikh al-Islam to the simple Effendi, in their architects, banks, bankers, clerks, jewellers, lawyers, stewards, physicians, etc., etc., of whom the greater portion are Christian subjects, and for the most part Armenians and Greeks. And then, as regards the sovereign himself, does not his imperial majesty, Sultan Hamid, place adequate confidence in and evince respect for his subjects, even to the extent of placing his life and the lives of his court at the mercy of Christian physicians? Um, so, he's trying to sort of counter the image of Abdul Hamid II in Europe at that time, which was already starting to be um, the image of the Red Sultan, which would come um, even more um, after the subsequent massacres. So um, it, it's quite striking that he's trying to provide this positive account of the relationship between Abdul Hamid II and his Christian subjects um, at this time, because it seems that um, the architect that he used to work for, Sarkis Balian, um, was actually um, starting to be slandered um, around this time. So um, it seems, and it's likely that Sopon Bazidjan had actually moved to Britain um, amidst these negative relations between Abdul Hamid II and um, his chief architect, um, and had moved to, to Manchester to sort of build a new life in the context of these difficulties that his former um, boss was experiencing. Um, so I'm, I'm still not, not totally sure why he would um, want to project such a positive view of relations between the Christians and Sultan Abdul Hamid II at this particular moment, um, other than perhaps he was trying to improve relations between um, Great Britain and the Ottoman Empire as a way of protecting his family and friends back home um, and to try and um, improve relations for the future. So perhaps he, he felt... Um, knowing Abdul Hamid II personally, knowing um, his family over several generations, um, perhaps he felt that Abdul Hamid II was becoming more and more um, paranoid and more and more sensitive about negative press in Britain and elsewhere in Europe about particularly relations between the Sultan and his Christian subjects. And maybe he was trying to help that situation um, through making these kind of statements. Um, in other words, I don't know at the moment, but that's, that's one explanation. Um, the other explanation is that he simply, uh, through his experience, he did witness positive relations between the Sultan and his subjects, um, particularly Armenians. And for the vast majority of his life, um, he had worked in the Ottoman Empire building the Sultan's palaces with a very multi-ethnic team of craftsmen um, and artists. So... Um, so from the majority of his working life, he had witnessed this to be true. Um, when he moved to Victorian Britain, he seems to, in addition to making the, the Book of Oriental Designs, um, which he hoped, I think, would, would make him a big name, um, he, in addition to doing that, he seems to have done bits and pieces of, of work as a jobbing designer, um, he designed um, advertisements like the top left and calendars. Um, he designed jewellery. And you can see lots of examples of his designs for furniture and, and other sort of household objects that he seems to have offered to individual pat patrons. 
Um, and as I said before, you can find dozens of these tiny little notebooks where he's written down um, his receipts. Um, and many of these seem to be in Turkish, which is interesting. Um, they're in Armenian script, but many of them actually seem to write out Turkish. Um, so I'm not sure whether it, when it referred to Armenian on the cover of um, his book, so it said it was translated from, from the Armenian by his son and his daughter, um, perhaps they meant Armino Turkish at that point. Perhaps he actually spoke in Turkish, not Armenian. It's not 100% sure, um, but certainly his own notebook seemed to be in Armenian script, but Turkish language. Or at least the bits that I've been able to read is um, that the ornament that surrounds the Armenian letters, the frame, is um, quite hybrid and it's quite similar actually to a lot of the mirror frames that are in the Dolmabache Palace. Um, because it has some of these symbols in the corners, like it's got a book in the top right and it's got telescope there. It has these sort of symbols of modernity um, mixed up with oriental ornament and then the Armenian letters and um, Mount Ararat in the middle, um, if you can see that there um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the circle and towards the bottom. Um, but there are some even more specific Armenian works um, that, that are in the archive. He did a few sketches of Armenian churches. I haven't been able to identify what that one is, so I'd be grateful if anybody knows what that one is. Uh, I thought maybe it would be Etchmizim, but it doesn't look like it. Uh, it I don't recognize it. Um, another thing that he designed, there are lots of drawings of altarpieces. And if you remember back from the Teotic text, um, it said that in 1902 he was invited by the Catholicos to design um, an altarpiece for Edgemitz. Um, so I wonder if this design may have been the design that he proposed for Edgemitz, but I don't know to what extent it was carried out. Uh, the one that's currently there is this one, and this one looks like quite a modern one, uh, but again, perhaps someone has more information from the audience than me about this example. Um, but to me, this looks like something that was made relatively recently, um, and you can find similar ones in, in other Armenian churches in Armenia. Um, in contrast, Sopon's design, again, shows a more sort of hybrid um, there's, there's some oriental ornament there. There's the Lamb of God at the bottom. I don't know if you can see uh, in the bottom register. Um, there's some little cherubim um, over the arch. Uh, but generally, there aren't that many open sort of Armenian national symbols in this one, in contrast with um, perhaps the, the eagles here um, and the blind arches from Armenian medieval architecture in that altarpiece. Um, another work that I'm trying to figure out what he's trying to do is this one, um, which is a print of Hayastan. Um, it was already published by another artist before, and this is his reworking of it. Um, and it doesn't have a date, um, so I'm trying to think when, when he produced it and for what um, purpose. Um, but it's totally different from everything else in his archive. Um, so... I'm not totally sure what the purpose was, um, what, the, what the change of mind um, could have been, uh, particularly as most of the statements in, in his text that he published were very pro-Ottoman um, Sultan and, and pro-easing sort of easing tensions within the empire. And this seems to be a much more um, sort of politicised image, um, and it provides an obvious parallel with the very famous image of Delacroix of... Um, uh, Athena on, on the rocks um, with the, um, the picture of the um, despotic um, Ottoman Turk in the background. <laughs> uh, so this was a, an image of national liberation, basically. So um, Sopon is trying to um, provide a, a parallel here through his depiction of Hayastan. Um, you've got Mount Ararat in the background. She's sitting on the ruins of all the Armenian settlements, it says, like Van and Erzurum, Karin, whatever, sorry, uh, on, the, um, on the ruins, and her crown is tumbled next to her um, feet, and her, um, her sword is, is um, there next to a, a pile of uh, wreckage in front of her. Um, so I, I've perhaps tried to associate that with um, 
some activism that took place in, amongst the British Armenian community in the 1880s. Um, but I'm not totally sure whether that is, um, because they put together a, um, a pamphlet called Higher Stand that I'll mention in the final section. So I think perhaps that could have been part of it, um, but I'm not totally sure. So um, I think now we'll briefly move and talk about Armenians in London. Um, I will begin by talking about um, some individuals and um, some other engagements in, in activism um, as a way to, to work up to um, the final section where we'll look at activism in more detail. Um, so I always tell my students, um, remember that London in uh, the middle to late 19th century to the early 20th century was a very multicultural place. Victorian studies has tended to wipe out these other populations and to forget about the fact that they were already there and uh, that there were, were all these cultural encounters taking place. Um, but in more recent years, it has started to be written back into mainstream British uh, historiography, um, this more um, diverse uh, impression of what Victorian London used to be like. Um, <clears throat> and Armenians were, were but one community amongst many others, um, and there were even leading politicians who had um, diverse backgrounds like um, Disraeli himself. So um, the first instance um, that we have of Armenian activism in, in London, in multicultural uh, Victorian London, is as early as 1850. Um, this very uh, enigmatic character, Christi Christopher Oskanian, um, established a place called Oriental Museum, or, or the museum, uh, the Ottoman Museum in London. Um, he he wrote it differently depending on which language he was writing in, which is also quite interesting. In English, it's the Oriental Museum. In Ottoman, it's um, uh, Musei Osmanie fi Londra, so um, Ottoman Museum in London. So um, he was presenting it slightly differently for different audiences. Um, so this was an, a real physical museum uh, that this subject of the Ottoman Empire, he was from the Ottoman Empire, he travelled to London, um, and he established a museum in 1854 in Leicester Square um, that was um, hoping to uh, do a similar thing to what Sopon Bezirjan was trying to do in his introduction and um, um, sort of uh, approach misconceptions, Western misconceptions of the Ottoman Empire, what he viewed to be misconceptions. Um, so it was a museum that was halls of wax dummies uh, which were representing various aspects of the Ottoman Empire, in particular famous figures and aspects of social life. So it must have been absolutely brilliant to visit in person. I wish they had photographs of it. I haven't seen any photographs. I've just seen this catalogue of the museum, which is again in the British Library, so you can go and see this. Um, more recently, somebody in America called Nora Lessersone is writing her PhD on Christopher Oskanian, so I'm sure we'll get to know much more in a few years' time when she publishes her work. Um, but this is all you can find at the moment, which is this catalogue that's in the British Library of this museum that once existed. And it includes images, um, engraved images, of um, presumably representations of the wax dummy displays that were there. Um, so there, there were different sections um, to combat the different prejudices of the West. So this is about the women, Ottoman women. Um, it's called the women's toilette or toilet in the harem. Um, it's an image of the harem. So this was the, the women's section of um, the Ottoman palace uh, where the sultan's um, favourites um, would live. Um, and so... Um, it addresses various aspects of the life of the harem that were misunderstood in the West. Um, and one of these misunderstandings is that um, the title of the Sultan is not given to the wives of His Majesty, as is erroneously supposed, but only to females of the royal blood. Um, so the vast majority of the catalogue in the museum is nothing to do with Armenians, even though this guy was from the Armenian community of the Ottoman Empire. However, um, there are a few bits that are about Armenians, and I think they're quite telling. Um, 
he um, includes an image of a Ivaz or scullion um, who's described as, um, in quotes, usually Armenians to whom Muslim one, the Muslim one generally trusts his family and property. Um, there's an image of an Armenian wedding, which is shown here, showing the priest and uh, the traditional costumes. And there's also an image of this guy here, who was Kazan, Kazaz Artin Bezdian, who was the director of the Imperial Mint and one of the Amiras, um, who, who I mentioned last week, who were these really important, notable families. Um, so I think that's quite interesting, that the only mention of the Armenians is this very positive mention of how close they were to the Sultan, how trusted they were by Muslims, um, and some representation of their tra traditional sort of um, culture and, and society. Um, so, um, again, that's like one of the earliest engagements in activism. So, an interesting question is, when does it change this, um, this effort to sort of communicate about how positive relations were between the Sultan and, and his subjects and, and change to um, a different agenda? Um, so, I thought... In part of the discussion, we can cover Gulbenkian. Um, I'm interested in him primarily um, from a cultural perspective because of his art collecting, um, his role as a luxury goods trader as well, and um, because of his church that I'll turn to in a minute. I'm sure you're all familiar with the recent book by Jonathan Conlin, uh, which goes into a lot of detail about his business activities, and I'd recommend reading that if you're interested at all in his biography and his business uh, networks and his importance to the petroleum business. Uh, so that's a recent, very detailed work. What I thought I'd flag up now, which might be of interest, is that he actually stayed in a boarding house in Ealing. Um, I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Along with um, nobles of Hawaii. So it's fascinating that in Ealing there are all these sort of boarding houses filled with super, super uh, wealthy international students. Um, and the first time I read about this, um, was in Jonathan Conlon's book that actually members of the Balian family were based in Ealing at this time too, um, which, you know, <laughs> just down the road, which is amazing. Um, so perhaps somebody might want to research that in the future. Um, I'm sure there will be documents in queue about that. And they were actually connected to the Hunchak family, the, the Hunchak party, um, and Mihran. Damadian and these kind of figures who were also in London at the time. So that's going back to what I said at the beginning, that there might be interesting works to be done on these political networks in London at this time. Um, so I think I'll, I'll skip through Gulbenkian just to focus on his church, really, because it's an interesting comparison with the Manchester one. So by 1922-23, when this church was built, um, the, the stylistic... Um, configuration of what an Armenian church in Britain should be seems to have changed completely. And um, Gulbenkian, again, seems to have approached one of the leading British architects, who was um, Arthur Davis with his working partner, Charles Mewis, um, and he asked them to design his church, um, which would be in Kensington, which is still there now, which was in honour of his parents, I think. Um, so it was sort of a I have to make a collection of correction here because mm -hmm. I keep saying this because this year is the 100th anniversary and mm -hmm. I keep trying to point this out that actually it was the Armenian community in London who actually started this initiative. They collected the money. It's only when they were short they, they approached Kulbenkian to make the shortfall and he said, I will do the shortfall as long as it's named after my fathers and Sarkis. So that's the real story. But oh, really? Part of the money was actually from the Armenian community. Oh, well, that's even more it's interesting. Correct. It's more correct. What the Gulbenkian family now claims, and don't worry about the member of Irish Council, yeah, you know, what they, they claim that Gulbenkian uh, himself paid money back. Everyone who donated, yeah. basically, community started digging the foundation, money ran out. Yeah. But Gulbenkian paid back every one of them, and he bought the whole land. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry, that's <laughs> the story. That's the story, really. Mm. Sorry. He paid back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it's fascinating to hear that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm curious about how much control he would have had then over the style versus the other donors. Um, because as far as I've seen, nothing has been written about 
this church in terms of the style. Jonathan Conlon didn't seem to discuss it in his book, um, although he does enter into Gulbenkian's art collection in some detail, which is one of his interests, but he doesn't seem to mention the church. Um, so I don't know to what extent Gulbenkian um, decided that it had to be a copy of Herput, which is this very famous Armenian monastery um, in in Armenia, and I think it's quite possible that Gulbenkian could have requested that because he had travelled quite thoroughly through the Caucasus, and Harpat is kind of on the road where you would travel from Tiflis to Yerevan, so I think it's quite likely that he would have visited it on several occasions, so it, I, I don't know, maybe I'm romanticising too much the role of Gulbenkian in this project, but I think perhaps he would have wanted to have control over the appearance and he would have requested that. So perhaps the stylistic model would have come from him or someone else who was very powerful in the community. Um, the story I know is that the architect got a lot of designs and mm -hmm. chose this because it was the closest one they could work with. Yeah, really. The other ones are Oh, too complicated. Oh, really? And that's the bell tower, it's based on the bell tower. Mm, yeah, yeah, and that's interesting because it is quite, yeah, as opposed to um, the, <coughs> the more church. complex plans, yeah, it is relatively simplistic, the, the facade. Um, yeah, well, that's a really interesting piece of background as well. Um, so then, I suppose that the question is what kind of potential models did they put forward? Were they all medieval Armenian models or were they from various different periods in Armenian history? That would be worth looking into. Um, and another interesting comparison is um, the stained glass window here in comparison with the Manchester one. Um, why does it show the Armenian cross as opposed to the Armenian letter that perhaps is more culturally specific or although the Armenian cross itself is also culturally specific, but um, perhaps an outsider wouldn't be able to um, recognize the Armenian letter as being an Armenian letter, whereas um, the cross could be misread as any observer to being just a cross rather than an Armenian cross, perhaps. Um, however, I think, I think the church itself, it clearly presents itself as an Armenian church now, so it's quite different from the Neo-Gothic um, Church of 1870. Um, and um, yeah, Arthur Davis and, and um, his um, partner were, were the leading architects at the time, so I think it's quite logical that um, Gulbenkian or the other uh, notable Armenians of the London community would have chosen them to build their church, um, particularly as one of their leading recent works was the Ritz Hotel, where Gulbenkian would have spent lots of time and other wealthy Armenians would have spent lots of time, and it was the most trendy um, <clears throat> nightlife location in London. Um, so it would have had a lot of prestige to bring the architect of the Ritz, um, not only the Ritz London, but also the Ritz Paris, um, to build your church um, <laughs> in your uh, local community. Um, the last point of this section relates to some other research that I've started to do on Armenian antiquities dealers. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I became interested in this, um, I think, through reading about Gulbenkian um, and um, some other Armenians in London at the time, and it became clearer to me that there was a, a group of very powerful Armenian um, Oriental um, antiquities or artwork um, dealers, particularly from around the 1890s, active in London. Um, and they seem to have reached a peak in the early 20th century, and then many of them went off to America after that, um, or to somewhere else, Paris, or seem to have relocated. So there was a sort of golden age of Armenian antiquities dealers um, in the 1890s to 1910s or 1920s. Um, and um, they seem to have helped establish lots of the Islamic art collections in the London museums, the British Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum in particular. So they were really influential in developing very close relationships with the curators, or they were called the keepers, of the Islamic arts um, sections in those museums at this time, uh, when those collections were being formed. Um, and um, there's lots of documents. If you go to the Victoria and Albert Museum Archive and the British Museum Archive, there's lots of really interesting documents uh, that tell about the correspondence between these dealers 
uh, when they arrive to London and they have all these objects that they want to show to the curators and they arrange an appointment and, um, and then the corresponding, um, you know, um, bartering about price and, and what items the, the keepers or the curators wanted to buy and what they didn't want to buy, what they rejected on what grounds. Um, it's very interesting in terms of um, how they formed the co collections of the museums, what they were looking for, what they viewed to be a good representation of Islamic art and how this differed um, in terms of the Armenian um, ideas and the museum curator's ideas and how the Armenians actually had quite a lot of impact on changing the curator's ideas in many cases. Um, so um, the examples I've looked at include Hagop Kevorkian, um, uh, Dikran Kalekian and... Um, Minassian family as well, uh, but there are several, there are many others that I could potentially look at in the future. Um, so this is a typical example where they just list all the exam examples of antiquities that they brought. Um, so they might be coming from the Ottoman Empire, from Iran excavations, from um, uh, mainly they were from the Ottoman Empire because that was where they they mainly established their. Um, a sort of trading house and they shipped them over from there to um, Britain. Um, so most of them came through the Ottoman Empire even though many of them came from archaeological digs that were taking place first in Iran. Um, so it was a mixture of Persian and Ottoman mainly um, goods but some things were more ancient than that. Um, so yeah, so they established themselves almost purely in Bishopsgate area in London. Um, and they, had, they seem to have quite cl close relationships with one another. Um, so this is another ex an example, Dikran Kalekian. I, I found Kalekian particularly interesting because he, um, he seems to go through a sort of um, changing relationship with the Victorian Albert Museum. And um, in the 1890s, he starts to appear and he offers lots of objects to the v and and he has very positive relationships with the curators there. Um, and then around um, 1909, um, he, he tries to sort of um, cement his close relationship with the v and Museum by giving them a donation of his ceramics collection, his Persian ceramics collection. Um, and um, the v and seem to be um, quite reticent about this because they don't like the idea of it being um, a sort of advertisement for um, Kalekian and they want to, um, they're worried that um, it's not actually a donation, it's a, a loan. So they're, they're worried that through displaying his collection in their museum, he will increase the price of his ceramics um, on the market and it will be like an advertisement for Kalekian. Um, and then he'll take the ceramics back and he would have gained financially from the museum. So the museum is very like stuffy about that. Um, but, but I think it's actually coming from not, not a commercial perspective. I think it's actually relating to his changing relationship perhaps with Armenian heritage because um, from 1909 he actually moves his operations away from the Ottoman Empire. Um, um, I'm not sure if it's to do with the Young Turk Revolution or the Adana massacres and, and sort of deterioration of relations at that point um, because I actually saw that several of the dealers seemed to move their operations and close their office in Constantinople around that point and move to London and then later move to America and Paris. Um, so anyway, I thought perhaps it was about establishing his memory within the V&A Museum through loaning his collection and that he had... He didn't seem to have an intention to take it out later and to make money from it, from the correspondence that I've seen anyway. So my argument is more about um, he's trying to publicize his ceramic collection and um, create some sort of um, memory of his, his work and, and where he's coming from um, through this display in the museum at this time that was a very difficult political time for his community. Um, he also at the same time publishes a book um, on his pottery collection and in this book he um, puts forward an idea of um, the quality of Ottoman ceramics um, and how they should be viewed as um, an equal to Persian ceramics because Persian ceramics were viewed to be superior by museum keepers at this time. Um, so he tries to persuade um, the art world that Ottoman ceramics were actually 
um, of more value than they'd been assumed in the past. And um, within this argument, he promotes the role of the Armenian um, ceramic industry, those potters who were working in Kutahia, um, who were um, making the majority of the Ottoman ceramics at that time in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so he includes these examples of Kutahia ceramics um, within his book that he publishes in 1910. So again, I think he's trying to use his work and his career as a Armenian, as an Islamic art dealer or an antiquities dealer to say something about um, the position of Armenians and, and their importance within the Ottoman Empire at a time when they were being, you know, about to be erased, basically. Um, <clears throat> But there's this, this also strange, uncomfortable contradiction that many of these Armenian dealers were also selling Armenian objects to the v and and to other museums. And these objects were often coming from um, questionable contexts. Um, so these are just two examples of um, staffs um, that were sold to the v and um, Neither of them are from Kalekian, who was the dealer that I was just mentioning. Um, so I find it interesting, and perhaps we can discuss at the end, how um, on the one hand they're promoting this idea of the value of Armenian art and um, the participation of Armenians in the Ottoman Empire and how important this was. Um, but they're also sort of taking objects away from the community and selling them to um, museum collections. Although perhaps in their view then they would be enshrined in the collection and visible for everybody to see um, and not hidden away in a church. So perhaps there was th that, that could be their agenda there. Anyway, this is a, an idea that, that we might want to discuss at the end, that they were clearly active in selling Armenian objects to the museums at the same time that they were selling Islamic objects. So um, the final section is um, looking at Armenian activism and lobbying. Um, so it seems to build up from the 1880s um, and change in direction in the 1880s, which was before really the, the Hamidian massacres, but it was after things like Satan. Um, so there, there seems to be a change in, in direction. Um, one of the first examples is mentioned in Joan George's book, which was a letter um, sent to Gladstone around 1880 from the Manchester merchants. Um, and also from the, the priest of the Armenian church. And also in 1880, there was a publication called Hayastan sent to Westminster by the Armenian Patriotic Society of Europe, uh, which was led by um, someone called Garabed Hagopian, who many of you probably know about, because again, he was relatively local to here. Um, and so I s suspect that perhaps this drawing, this engraving by Sopon Bezidjian may have come as part of this um, because I simply don't know anywhere else to tie it to. Um, <clears throat> so this was the first sort of political publication in a way um, because it called for action on the situation that Ottoman Armenians were facing, um, so much so that it actually... Um, embarrassed the patriarch who Joan George says complained to British politicians about this. Um, following this in 1885 we start to see more cultural activism and, and the change in direction um, through a special issue of the graphic magazine uh, which was devoted to Annie um, and this was around the time of the excavations of Annie uh, that I mentioned in some previous weeks. Um, so this was trying to publicize the archaeological finds about the medieval architecture of the city of Annie um, across the world, um, and specifically in Britain, because this was a British publication in 1885. Um, and again, the person who was um, responsible for making this happen was Garabed Hagopian, who was a, a local Armenian um, to here, who we'll come to in a minute. Um, so this Garabed Hagopian... Um, I don't think he was Acton, but he was somewhere, somewhere in London, I can't remember. There's a picture of his house in Joan George's book, um, if you want to look it up, exactly where he lived. But he was um, in London and was particularly active in the 1880s and subsequent decades in lobbying um, about the Armenian issue. 
Um, he was a teacher of Oriental languages and seems to have been engaged in teaching officers um, Oriental languages, so he had good connections with military classes in Britain. Um, and he was also um, <clears throat> in contact with Migadic Portugalian, who was this Ottoman Armenian who established the first Armenian political party in the Ottoman Empire in Van, called the Armenian Party. Um, so this was not a revolutionary party exactly, but it was a precursor to the revolutionary parties. So he was advocating some degree of um, sort of separate administration for the Armenian provinces within the Ottoman Empire. Um, so Garabet Hagopian was very active in doing a number of things. So he, he forwarded these drawings of Annie to the graphic. So he was trying to raise awareness about Armenian culture and the value of Armenian culture already in 1885. Um, he would write letters to the Times and missionary reporters. So Garabed Hagopian was writing to the Times to say actually these reports of the massacres were, as far as we can tell, uh, quite, quite truthful. Um, so he was putting pressure on a number of different fronts, basically. He was writing to the, to the newspapers, he was circulating images of um, Armenian culture, um, he was teaching officers Oriental languages, um, and he was leading what was called the Armenian Patriotic Society of Europe, uh, which was a sort of connected organisation to the Armenian party. Um, and he was lobbying politicians like Gladstone and Viscount Wright. Um, following on from him, we have um, a female activist um, who again is, is in great need of, of further research. Um, I was contacted by somebody who's writing a novel about her, so I was excited to hear about that, so one day we might have a novel. Um, but um, as far as I know, there hasn't been much research about her. She's a fascinating subject. Um, she was the daughter, Zabel Boyajian is her name, she was the daughter of the dragoman who was the translator and the vice consul um, to Diyarbakir, Thomas Boyajian, who was murdered in 1895. And um, <clears throat> I remember him actually because I've read quite a lot of the consular correspondence from Diyarbakir and I remember his, he was quite a, obviously quite a prominent personality in that correspondence. Um, and he was killed in, in 1895. So following that, she moved to London and um, attended the Slade School of Art, and she took a different direction in terms of how she wanted to raise awareness about the Armenian people. She um, used her artistic skills, and she published an illustrated book called Esther, um, as well as a number of other books. Um, that one was about the Hamidian massacres, um, and she also published Armenian legends and poems in 1916, which uh, Ms. Ek has a wonderful copy of there. Um, and you can have a look at it afterwards. It's absolutely beautifully illustrated um, with these um, images that they, um, they're quite similar. Some of them are similar to um, the highest down image of Sopon Bezidjan, and they have this wonderful um, Armenian medieval ornament framing them. Um, and they're, they're beautiful polychrome um, designs. Um, she was also important not just in, in writing her books and publishing them as an artist, um, but she was also engaged in lobbying um, through holding Armenian, Anglo Armenian cultural events. Um, and um, <clears throat> the way I got to know about her was actually um, through um, documents in the Sykes archive, which again, I recommend you to access. Um, I think you have to pay some fee to access it. It's through this website, britishonlinearchives.co.uk, but I think it wasn't particularly expensive, maybe 20 pounds or something like that. Um, but um, the Sykes archive, through looking at the Sykes archive, I became aware of her, um, her lobbying of important politicians at the time. Um, so Mark Sykes was an incredibly important um, Foreign Office um, member of the personnel. He was um, attaché to the British Embassy in Constantinople from 1905 to 1906, um, assistant to Balfour, 
Um, he also worked in the intelligence unit during the war and traveled widely through the Ottoman Empire um, <clears throat> and uh, through the Arab provinces in particular. And um, he was MP for Hull in 1911 and is best known for his Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916, which aimed to carve up the former territory of the Ottoman Empire into dif different um, national territories. So um, <clears throat> in his archive, you can see um, that um, Armenians were contacting him. As, as we know from Joan George's work, they were contacting people like Gladstone and um, Viscount Bryce. And um, they were writing to Mark Sykes to invite him to things like um, the, uh, the Lord Mayor's um, fund um, events and um, they were organising um, an Armenian tribute to Shakespeare, uh, which was an event that was like a sort of a celebration with various speakers who would talk about Shakespeare and how important Shakespeare um, in London. So they produced this journal and circulated it to important figures like Mark Sykes, and I've got a copy of it from the Sykes archive that was sent to him directly. Um, so this journal was, um, again, a number of different articles drawing attention to um, Armenians' Armenia's past, so there was an article on the city of Van in the issue that I saw and it was telling about the history of Van and then um, the, the more difficult situation um, with um, the genocide and, and subsequent to the genocide um, the uh, Russian um, occupation, well the Russian um, victory there and, and the prospect of um, sending Armenian deportees back to Van uh, that was being discussed in 1917. Um, so there were a number of different articles. They were also discussing Nubar Pasha, so they were sort of framing Nubar Pasha as a potential um, leader of um, Armenia in the future. Um, but I would say a key agenda of the, the journal or the magazine was to not only tell about the current political situation in Armenia, but to also tell about Armenian culture in the past and try to build up an image of Armenian culture as um, being part of European civilization and having a sort of common um, history with um, European um, classical past. And the description of the city of Van, for instance, draws attention to the classical ruins in Van um, as part of the article. So um, perhaps we'll discuss these things further in the, um, in the discussion after the break. Um, and I just wanted to finish with saying that um, Mark Sykes had um, this wonderful um, Turkish room, which was like a Turkish hammam that was built for his house in Sledmere House in, in North Yorkshire. Um, it was built by an Armenian ceramic artist, David Ohanisian, um, in 1911 to 1913. So um, this was before the, the sort of... Um, the, um, the peak of the activities of um, Ararat. Ar Ararat had already been established by the end of the relationship between Mark Sykes and David Ohanisi and this Armenian ceramicist. Um, but it's interesting that Mark Sykes already had quite a close relationship with some Armenians um, by 1911, way before um, the genocide and, and way before um, he started to have a more public pro-Armenian um, persona that we see later on in sort of 1916-1917. So um, anyway, that what I'm trying to say is that there was a behind-the-scenes act of lobbying people like Mark Sykes that was um, being enacted by people like Zabel Boagian, and um, they were sending him letters, they were sending him these journals and pamphlets, they were inviting him to um, social activities like the Armenian celebration of Shakespeare. Um, and there was also a personal interaction behind the scenes between Mark Sykes and Armenians like this Armenian ceramic artist who he met himself in Aleppo. Um, 
And um, all of these things helped to change the mind of Mark Sykes, who was previously quite anti-Armenian and quite pro-Turkish. And so after the genocide, uh, by 1916 or so, Mark Sykes and other politicians in his very influential circle were starting to make more, much more pro-Armenian statements in public. So it was successful, but it was too late, unfortunately, for the genocide, but, but it did have some impact on important personalities at the time. Um, so if you want to see some more examples of um, the kind of documents that you can find in the Sykes Archive, I've got some examples here. Um, this is a letter from James Malcolm, um, who's telling Mark Sykes that he sent him a, the latest copy of Ararat, um, James Malcolm seems to have been someone who was very active in writing to British politicians at the time, a, a member of the local Armenian community. Um, here he's the same guy, James Malcolm, is writing to Mark Sykes again to say that he's just um, been informed that Nubar Pasha has written to President w Woodrow Wilson about the Armenian situation and it says um, it's begging him not to overlook the fact that the position of the oppressors and oppressed are entirely different vis-a-vis -vis the civilized and humanitarian world. Um, so again it's showing that um, trying to convince these politicians that Armenians are um, sort of um, <clears throat> part of the same civilizational um, development of um, Europe and America in order to make them act. And this is a final example from the Sykes Archive, which is from 1918, which is a group of Armenian women in Aleppo um, who sign the letter at the bottom, and they're writing to Mark Sykes um, to say that they've survived the deportations and they've witnessed lots of horrible things, and that um, they need to raise his awareness of the situation of Armenian women who have been... Um, taken away from their families, women and children who have been taken away from their families and are found in um, the homes of Turks, Kurds, Arabs, Chechens and other groups and they're trying to get him to make some sort of um, <clears throat> movement on, on that issue. So that's um, another way that Armenians were trying to contact him. Um, so yeah, feel free to come and have a look at those things and I've got PDFs that I can give to you as well of those documents. But also explore yourselves um, on the website. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry.